Perfect. Well, thanks everyone for joining us on Quebec's uh, reading week, but hopefully maybe reading weeks other uh, elsewhere. We're really excited to have Angelica Nande with us today. Angelica was in the same lab when she was doing her PhD when I was doing my postdocs. So we've uh, I've been watching her work for a while now and I'm excited to hear more about what she's been doing. Uh, uh, Dr. Nande received her PhD in theoretical and mathematical physics in 2021 from Harvard University and she holds an MSci in theoretical and mathematical physics from the University of Birmingham in the UK and a Master of Arts in Physics from Harvard University. In her PhD, she used mathematical modeling to study infectious diseases and the immune system. And she continues that work now as a postdoctoral researcher at the Johns Hopkins Whiting or Whiting School of Engineering. Sorry, Whiting. <laughs> Whiting. <laughs> her works appeared in Nature Communications and Nature Medicine. We're very excited to hear um, some of her work on this transmission network structure of spread of SARS-CoV-2. So thanks very much, Angela. Yeah, thank you so much, Morgan, for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present our work at this seminar. Uh, so like Morgan said, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins and with Allison Hill, I work on many different aspects of infectious disease modeling. And today I'm going to just present some of the work that we've done in the past two years that focuses on the role played by the transmission network structure on the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so before going into the details of our work, I usually like to give a brief introduction of how human-to-human -human disease transmission is modeled, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. A common way to model such transmission is to classify individuals in a population into discrete stages of infection, and then we track the transition between these different states. And these models are referred to as compartmental models. In the simplest models, uh, individuals are only divided into in infected and uninfected categories. But more commonly, this is made slightly more realistic by adding a class of individuals that have recovered from the infection and may be immune or individuals that have died. And depending upon the disease and question of interest, infected individuals may be further classified uh, depending upon whether they have symptoms, whether they're infectious, how severe the disease is, et cetera. And the transition between these states occur at rates which are specified by model parameters. Uh, for example, you have parameters that describe the duration of infection, the probability of death, or the chance that a contact with an infectious individual will lead to the transmission of an infection. So very briefly going to describe one of the most well-known examples of this type of a model, which is called the SIR model, and it consists of susceptible, infected, and recovered individuals. We can represent this model as follows by a flow diagram. So susceptible individuals here become infected by contacting infected individuals. And so this part of the process is nonlinear as it depends upon both the number of susceptibles and the number of infected. And then infected individuals recover at a constant rate, which is independent of any other interaction. We can represent such models either uh, by a system of differential equations or they can be treated stochastically. As you can see, this model is quite simple and it ignores a huge amount of variability that exists in the real world. For example, the model assumes that all the individuals are equally susceptible to disease, when in reality, susceptibility might depend upon the age or general health of an individual. But despite all of these simplifications, this model has been extremely useful and can capture some important aspects of an epidemic. So R0, which is defined as a basic reproductive ratio, is an important concept associated with such models. We define it as the average number of new infections by a single infected individual in a population of only susceptible individuals. So intuitively, R0 increases when there are more contacts between individuals, when the per contact transmission probability is high, or when people are just infected for a much longer time. It is worth stressing that R0 isn't an intrinsic biological property of a particular infection, and it depends a lot upon human behavior as well as environmental factors. And if you want to design any intervention, the goal is usually to try to reduce R0 to be below one. So this diagram here shows example dynamics of the model where R0 is greater than one, and we track the three different compartments. 
at the beginning, the outbreak grows exponentially because there are just a lot of susceptible individuals that are around to infect. And then as more and more of the population gets infected, the number of susceptible individuals reduces, uh, the speed of the spread reduces, and eventually infection dies out. And it is worth noting that even in the absence of an intervention, this model predicts that not all of the population gets infected. Uh, this model is also a good starting point to introduce the idea of a vaccination threshold or a herd immunity threshold. The effective R0 of an infection can be reduced to below one by removing some people from this susceptible compartment into the recovered compartment uh, by vaccination. And in this SIR model, the fraction of individuals who need to be vaccinated this way can be calculated. But this uses the starting intrinsic R0 value. And if the vaccine is introduced sometime after some individuals have naturally recovered from infection, as opposed to before outbreak begins, the fraction that needs to be vaccinated is a bit lower. So this SIR model is very commonly used in epidemiology used to describe infections that grant immunity to people after they recover, at least for the duration of the epidemic. So next I will discuss how such a model has been adapted to COVID-19. So I'm now going to describe a more complicated SIR type compartmental model that has been used to study the dynamics of COVID. This model explicitly keeps track of different stages of infections which are relevant to the disease. So I should point out that this was used mainly during the initial stages of the pandemic. So this is before widespread vaccination and the emergence of new variants. But these things can also be easily added to such a model. So this model consists of susceptible individuals that get infected after encountering uh, infected individuals and they first go into an exposed stage. Here the individuals are in their latent stage of infection and are not really infectious. Then they move to a mild infection class from which they can either recover or get more severely infected. Here, severe infection corresponds to individuals who require hospitalization. These individuals can again either recover or continue to get critically infected. So now they need ICU level care from which they can either recover or die. Now, there are a few different reasons why such a detailed model is useful. At the beginning of the pandemic, one of the main goals of modeling COVID was to understand the potential strain on healthcare capacity due to individuals that would require hospitalization or ICU level care, and also to forecast the burden of deaths. And to do this, we require models to explicitly keep track of all of these different stages of infection. This is a plot that shows example dynamics of such a model um, and where we show the fraction of population in each of these different stages of infection. And this is in the absence of any type of intervention. And so such models made it very clear early on that if we had allowed epidemics to run its course, it would massively overrun our existing healthcare capacity. Secondly, the model also allows us to study the impact of social distancing interventions that may be employed. So here in the model, intervention corresponds to reducing the rate at which susceptibles get infected. And these models also help us to give us an insight into what to expect once such an intervention has been enacted. So for example, here we see that if an intervention is 70% effective at reducing uh, new infections, we see an immediate uh, reduction in new cases with a slight lag in hospitalizations. However, if the intervention was say 50% effective, even if the generation of new infections decreases quite, slow, uh, quite quickly, that is the speed of the epidemic does slow down, it can take weeks until hospitalizations and deaths peak and then eventually turn around. So in these previous models and the slides, uh, the total rate of transmission was just assumed to be proportional to the total number of susceptible and infected individuals. So we just assumed a mass action process like a chemical reaction in a well mixed solution. And this implies that everyone's risk of infection is the same. So if we think of this in terms of a network of contacts between individuals, it corresponds to a fully connected network where everyone connect, is connected to each other. But we know from our own experiences that our contacts are not random. We have more frequent contact with our household members, school work colleagues as friend, and friends, as opposed to just random people in the population. And this is also reflected in data. 
So this is an example of a extremely detailed contact survey that has mapped out for different populations the average number of daily contacts that individuals at every age have with individuals at every other age. And this contact matrix strong, shows a very strong non-random pattern. These bright dots here correspond to people that have more interactions. So we see that people tend to interact with other people in their own age, or as these two narrower bands show, that there are interactions between children and adults. So such data has helped us understand sort of the structure of family, schools, and workplaces. Another example in this figure, we see the transmission history of SARS outbreak in Singapore in 2003. And as you can see, even though most people spread the disease to just one or two others, there are certain individuals who spread the infection to a large number of contacts. So such a distribution of secondary infections cannot be explained by a model in which we assume that everyone is connected to everyone else and has the same number of contacts. So another situation where a well-mixed model misses important effects is when we want to model the effects of targeted interventions like vaccinating certain groups of people or shutting down schools and workplaces. For example, say we have a limited number of vaccines to give, uh, and then it's definitely better to vaccinate individuals who are the so-called hubs obviously only if you can identify them, as immunizing them indirectly protects a lot of people. And so depending upon the question, the population structure can be very important and models incorporated in many different ways. But one of the most general approach is this network approach. Here we say that an infected individual can transmit infection to only other individuals that they are in direct contact with. And mathematically, this is represented by an adjacency matrix where in the simplest case consists of zeros and ones to indicate whether two people are connected or not. So this brings us more to one of our projects. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, so this is early 2020, we became interested in the role played by household transmission on the effectiveness of social distancing measures. This was important because at that time, the main tool that we had at our disposal to control the pandemic was just some sort of a social distancing measure. And although these measures are useful, they do have a limitation. Such interventions only target reduction in contacts that occur outside of the household, but generally they don't do anything to reduce infection spread within households. And this is a major contributor to infection spread. In fact, Social distancing measures may even increase the rate of household transmission just because people are now spending a lot more time at home. So it was clear that in order to answer this question, uh, we couldn't ignore the transmission network structure. And so we modeled this compartmental COVID-19 model on a transmission network where we explicitly include household as well as external contacts. So the people in the model got assigned to households where the distribution of household sizes is obtained from the US census data and all individuals in a household are assumed to be connected to each other. Each individual then also has a certain number of non-household external contacts whose distribution is estimated from different types of contact surveys and intervention is assumed to only reduce external contacts. It's worth noting that ju uh, just knowing the number of household and external contacts is not enough. The relative contribution of these contacts to the transmission is hard to estimate. Um, for example, we could say that each household contact has a higher transmission rate because you might have a more intense physical contact with people you live with. But on the other hand, you can also say that maybe external contacts contribute more if people spend more of their waking hours outside of their home. And so we considered a wide range of values for the relative contribution of each. Another motivation for this work was that the dynamics of COVID-19 that were observed during uh, post lockdown in spring of 2020. And this is data from that wave for multiple settings in different parts of the world that did implement pretty strong social distancing interventions. Um, this data is showing daily counts of cases, deaths, and hospitalizations, but we do see a recurring pattern. In each case, it took weeks after implementing these measures to see a peak and a decline in cases, and even longer for hospitalizations and deaths. So we were wondering why this was observed even after very strong interventions. And we hypothesized that the clinical progression of COVID-19, that is the time it takes for individuals to move between different stages of infection, 
coupled with this realistic network structure of external and household contacts might help address this question. To just reiterate, we use a compartmental COVID-19 model and simulated infection dynamics on a network that divided contacts into household and external, and then we tried to quantify the effect of interventions. The first thing we noticed was that with these realistically structured populations, very strong reductions in external contacts were needed to stop the spread. So when the intervention was 100% effective, that is all external transmission is stopped, these effects are observed pretty quickly and the uh, epidemic is very successfully curved. However, such a strong measure is just not possible to implement in real life. Uh, so more realistically, say if an intervention was 80% effective, which was actually approximately the mean reduction of cases that some studies observed in the US in March and April of that year. Though this is a still a pretty strong social distancing intervention, we find that the decline in cases is quite slow and the epidemic persists in the population for a very long time. And this is made even worse if household transmission increases after enacting the intervention due to people spending more time at home. So uh, these results were assuming that household and external contacts have equal weight. That is the transmission probability for both of these contacts is the same. So we decided to see how this assumption affects the results. It turns out that it is a assumption is quite important and it affects the results quite a bit. So focusing on the graph in the middle, on the y-axis, we plot the final epidemic size. So this is the percent of people who will be infected by some point uh, for either a partially or fully effective social distancing intervention. And on the x-axis, we have the different contributions of uh, the relative weights of external contacts. Um, and which is also these proportions are given here on the left-hand side. So the bars correspond to the relative contribution of each contact type towards the total or not. So interestingly, we find that social distancing measures are most effective, so the smallest epidemic size, when external contacts either contribute a lot to transmission, so this is the uh, points on the far right, because in this case, eliminating external contacts eliminates most transmission, or if the external contacts contribute very little, because in this case, even if there is very strong household transmission, even weak intervention removes the infection, removes the ability for the infection to sort of jump between different houses, and then the epidemic can't be sustained. So the worst case scenario is actually this intermediate regime. This is because there is strong enough external transmission to seed households prior to the start of intervention, but there are still enough external contacts that get maintained during intervention um, coupled with strong household transmission, which leads the inspection to spread, even if the overall intervention was pretty strong. So next we can look at what kind of delays are expected in this model after intervention is put in place. And to quantify this, we look at delays to peaks of different infection classes when intervention has been imposed. So this figure shows these delays associated with different stages of infection for the non-network, so the well-mixed model, as well as the network model with different weights of these external contacts. So under 100% effective intervention, the delays to peak were mainly driven by the clinical progression of the disease alone. This is slightly increased for the network model due to the household spread that still continues even if all external spread is stopped. But overall, the values here are pretty similar. However, under an imperfect but still strong intervention, the times to peak were much longer in this network model, and they were very sensitive to the relative weights of the external and household contacts. So delay to peak cases was the longest in this intermediate regime that I mentioned before, when you have the external and household contribution approximately equal. And these long delays suggest that residual household transmission coupled with the clinical progression of the disease could, have, could account for the long delay between implementing the strong social distancing measures and the epidemic peaks that were observed in the data. So, so far in the results that are presented, the only structure in the network was the separation between household and external contacts. Although this was the simplest structure that allowed us to look at the role of household transmission, in reality, the network structure of external contacts is a lot more complicated. And in order to answer certain questions, a more realistic treatment is needed. 
For example, so far, social distancing was modeled by randomly removing some portion of external contacts, but this is not really realistic as it generally tends to happen in a more clustered manner. So for example, take essential versus non-essential workplaces. Essential workers have to keep their work contacts even during the intervention, whereas non-essential workers working from home would lose theirs. So to make the model a bit more realistic, such that it will allow us to study the effect of such clustered deletions, we constructed a age-segregated external contact network that consists of different types of external layers, where we include school, work, social, and community layers as part of the external contacts. The population is broadly divided into four age groups. Well, these pink are preschool age kids, purple are school age kids, blue is working age, and green is elderly. And depending upon their age groups, individuals get assigned to these different layers. So for example, adults only get assigned to workplaces. So to reflect the clustered adoption of social distancing measures in workplaces, we randomly removed entire workplaces during the intervention and saw how it affected our results as compared to a random deletion of contacts. But we found that some of the effects that we observed before, like the time that it takes until the epidemic peaks and started declining after an intervention was not really changed. But we did find that this sort of clustered deletion of external contacts can lead to much longer times for disease elimination. So what happens is that such clustered deletion leads to pockets in the network where the infection can persist for very long periods of time despite interventions. So this implies that in order to successfully achieve disease elimination, it's essential to identify as well as employ targeted interventions in groups where we expect such pockets of infection to persist. Another thing such a model allows us to look at is to see whether we can quantify an individual's risk of infection depending upon different factors, such as say their household size. So roughly at the end of the simulation, we look at the people who got infected and back out their probability of infection depending upon their household size. And we found that this risk increases super linearly with household size. This is because in larger households, there's just a lot more risk of catching an infection externally as there are a lot more external contacts, as well as there are more individuals to spread to within the household. Similarly, we can also examine the risk of infection faced by individuals who had to maintain their work contacts when these measures were in place, for example, to reflect risk faced by essential workers. And we find that these workers had a higher risk of infection and that this also leads to a higher risk amongst their household members. So these findings highlight the risk faced by communities in which larger households are common and or in which more individuals per household may have to maintain external connections uh, despite social distancing measures. So just to summarize this part of the talk, we find that the strength of within household transmission is an important determinant of success of social distancing measures. Coupled with residual external transmission, it governs the size of the epidemic, time to peaks, as well as individual risk of infections. This is really important for us to devise in part optimal social distancing strategies, because as we've all experienced, these measures are generally pretty disruptive. They're associated with large economic and social costs and can't be sustained for long periods of time. So these results highlight that policies that help control household spread are key to such optimization efforts. So this brings us to the next part of my talk. Having understood the importance of household spread led us to wonder what role evictions might play in the spread of infections during a pandemic. So to give you a bit of a background, in early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic led to mass unemployment in the US, as you can see by the spike here. And this aggravated the already existing eviction crisis. Many more US households were unable to pay rent and were at the risk of getting evicted. At that time, estimates suggested that this was tens of millions of households. And although unemployment rates have reduced now, as you can see by this decline here, Estimates from the end of 2021 still suggest around 7 million households in the US are behind on rent and around 3 million are at a risk of facing eviction. In general, it is difficult to estimate the exact percent of households that are at a risk of getting evicted. Some studies try to estimate this using uh, increase 
in eviction, saying that increase in eviction rates is proportional to unemployment rates, while other studies have used census data and other surveys to estimate. But across all of these different approaches, estimates from fall of 2020 suggested that throughout the country, anywhere from about half a percent to five or more percent of households could have faced evictions each month. And so to give you an idea of what this means, a 2% per month eviction rate roughly corresponds to about 8,000 8, households facing evictions each month uh, in a city of a size of 1 million in the United States. So temporary legislations to prevent evictions were enacted in the spring and summer of 2020, but they were originally set to expire by September 1st. And it was around this time that we became a bit worried about the effects that this might have on COVID transmission. Luckily, in early September, the CDC stepped in and put another temporary ban uh, on evictions for the fall, which ended up getting extended till August of next year despite facing a lot of court challenges that challenged the legal justification of this order. So we decided to use a model to try to quantify the importance of this eviction ban that the CDC imposed in September. Before describing the model, I want to just briefly explain why we were worried about evictions affecting COVID transmission. So generally what happens when people get evicted? So in reality, there are three different scenarios that can happen. Families either get rehoused, they double up with friends and family or become homeless and move to shelters. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of data that tracks the fate of evicted families, but a few studies that we did find showed that this doubling up is the most predominant outcome. So families tend to move in with other families. So for example, their family or friends. And so the main effect of evictions in cities is to shift the distribution of household sizes upwards. So this is just a bar graph showing the distribution of household sizes in the US and evictions would lead to more households with larger sizes shifting this distribution to the right. In addition to the work I discussed in the first part of my talk, there have been many other empirical and modeling studies that have looked at the role of households and the spread of such diseases. And they indicate that households are definitely a major source of transmission. As a result, it is reasonable to expect that evictions that cause an increase in household sizes would lead to an increase in transmission for such infections. And so we decided to use a mathematical model to try to quantify this effect. So the network we used to model the contacts was again split into two layers, one representing household contacts and another representing external ones. Each individual was assigned to a household with household sizes, again, derived from census. And then we assumed that the households were all fully connected. Each individual was then given a certain number of external contacts that are drawn from a distribution as shown here and are randomly assigned across the population. We decided to pick the strength and number of these external contacts such that the household secondary attack rate and the relative strength of transmission of, uh, with household versus external contacts matched the best available estimate. For our initial results, this was the only structure um, in, the in the network, but I'll discuss more realistic network structures later on. As doubling up is the most predominant outcome, we focused on this scenario and modeled evictions by fusing two previously separate households into a single bigger household. Uh, this eviction and fusing was also initially done randomly. In some of our simulations, we also allowed a, a small percent of evicted household to move into shelters, but we found that there wasn't a whole lot of data regarding shelters, so we couldn't really parametrize the model as precisely as we would have liked, and so we just left it as a sensitivity analysis. But the results that I'm going to describe today, their qualitative nature is not affected by this. Model the spread of infection itself, we used the same SIR type stochastic epidemic model that I described previously with interventions still corresponding to social distancing. So only the weights of the external contacts is reduced. So our goal was to first quantify the effect evictions would have had in cities in the US where they allowed to occur starting in September of 2020. So we first decided to create realistic epidemic trajectories over the course of the year in our model. And to do this, we collected COVID-19 data on deaths given by blue lines here and cases, which is red. 
aggregated for each US metropolitan statistical area with at least 1 million residents. This turned out to be approximately 50 cities, a few examples of which are shown on this slide. We then used this technique called dynamical time warping and hierarchical clustering on these case and death counts. So this essentially groups time series based on their similarities. And we found that this resulted uh, into four distinct types of cities. The first group of cities consists of cities like New York, Boston, Philly, that had large early epidemic peaks, which were followed by a strict lockdown, which resulted in a strong reduction in cases. The second group included cities like Chicago, Baltimore, Seattle, that had a large but a smaller overall spring peak, which were controlled and then followed by a long plateau of cases over the summer. Then the third group was metros like Salt Lake City and San Francisco, which had much smaller spring outbreaks, which were only partially controlled as they essentially plateaued in this plateaued, but then were followed by increases in the summer. And finally, you had we had metros similar to Miami, Houston, Atlanta, which also had small spring outbreaks, but experienced a much larger midsummer outbreak. Um, in the absence of evictions, we calibrated our model to each of these four trajectory types by modulating the degree of reduction in external contacts over time. And this is given by these trajectories in the bottom row. We then used these as a baseline case to compare the hypothetical effects that evictions would have had were they allowed to start in September 2020. So grouping cities this way allowed us to get a qualitative idea of the effects of evictions um, across these different epidemic trajectories, and it saved us the time and computational resources that would have been needed if we had tried to actually fit a, our stochastic network model to each of the epidemics in each of the cities. So I'm just going to first focus on the results for this first group of cities. These were the cities that had a very strong initial peak followed by a strong lockdown and then cases plateaued in the summer before resurging in the fall. We model as evictions by assuming that they would occur at a constant rate per month given by these lines and we assumed that this would start in September. We considered a wide range of potentially realistic values for the eviction rates. Then we compared the infection burden at a population level in the presence of evictions, so this orange uh, curve here, till the end of the year, and then compared it uh, with the scenario which was exactly the same, but then had no evictions till that point. So we found that the evictions resulted in measurable increases in the epidemic size, leading to thousands of excess infections in the city of a size of a million. So even for a very low eviction rate of 0.25% per month, it led to about 5,000 excess cases per million residents. Furthermore, we found that evictions substantially increased the infection risk for individuals who experienced them or for those individuals who merged households with those who did. So these are the orange dots here. And this is true even for very low eviction rates where the population level burden wasn't really dramatically altered. Moreover, the increased risk of infection was also felt by other individuals in the population. So these are the purple dots who technically didn't have faced really any direct effect of an eviction. So this highlights the effects due to spillover of excess cases of infections in the population at large. And as we live in a interconnected city, the effects of evictions aren't just restricted to people who are directly affected by it. We then looked at what would happen with new control measures enacted to counter this fall resurgence. This is the same scenario as before, but now we have an additional intervention that was enacted on December 1st. So just to give you a bit of a context, this work was done in fall of 2020 when the cases had just started resurging again. And at the time it seemed possible that there would be another lockdown, which actually didn't happen in practice. But this still allowed us to investigate how evictions might affect the efficacy of control measures. And we found that in the presence of evictions, this hypothetical lockdown would have been less effective. So compare versus the orange versus the blue lines here. Even in this case, for low eviction rates, this can lead to about an excess of 3,000 cases. And so we can conclude that evictions overall would reduce the effectiveness of any 
SARS-CoV-2 control efforts. So as mentioned previously, we found pandemic patterns in the US could be roughly divided into four groups. The results that I showed you were restricted to only one group so far, but the qualitative results remain the same for the rest of the three groups with or without this hypothetical winter lockdown. And we found that for all trajectories, if we allowed evictions to occur, they led to a significant increase in number of cases with anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 excess cases per million residents, even for very low eviction rates. In general, evictions had the most impact whenever they were allowed to occur during a fast growing epidemic. And this is probably one of the reasons why the effects are so similar across all of these scenarios, because most places in the US experienced a resurgence in the fall. An intuitive statistic that we found was that in most places, um, in most of the scenario, there was at least one excess infection in a city that was attributable to each eviction that took place. The results that have presented so far assume that evictions occur randomly throughout the city and that the infection burden as well as adoption of social distancing measures is homogeneously distributed across the population. In reality, however, this is not true as evictions tend to be clustered in lower socioeconomic areas and they're also likely to affect individuals who are disproportionately unable to adhere to different uh, social distancing uh, interventions due to a higher proportion of essential workers. And this has been reflected throughout the pandemic as many studies have shown the disproportionate burden faced by different demographic groups. So this is data from the CDC that shows the difference between the percent of COVID-19 deaths and population by race and Hispanic origin. So anything about zero here corresponds to a disproportionately high percent of COVID deaths relative to their percent in the population. So to understand the role played by such disparities, we first considered a hypothetical city, which consists of two neighborhoods. One corresponds to a high socioeconomic status and another to a lower socioeconomic status. The high socioeconomic neighborhood was characterized by no evictions and a high degree of adoption of social distancing measures. Whereas evictions were allowed to occur in this lower socioeconomic neighborhood and the adoption of social distancing measures was um, definitely to a lesser extent to sort of reflect the presence of essential workers. We simulated the epidemic time course using the same population average transmission rates as in the group one cities. As you might expect, even in the absence of evictions, uh, infection prevalence differed substantially between different neighborhoods. Furthermore, we noticed that despite simulating the same overall reduction in contacts, the total epidemic burden is always higher when we residual contacts are clustered in this low socioeconomic neighborhood. And this can be seen in this figure here where these blue dots correspond to the clustered scenario, whereas the orange dots correspond to the homogeneous case that was discussed before. So heterogeneity in the structure of cities um, can definitely lead to large impact of evictions on COVID-19 cases. Furthermore, we found that evictions served to increase pre-existing disparities in infection prevalence between different neighborhoods. Um, so on the plot here on the left, this is a relative risk of infection for low versus high socioeconomic neighborhoods. In the absence of evictions, this is the first dot here the relative risk of infection is already high, but it increases further as the rate of eviction increases. Um, we can also look at individual risks of infection. So individuals affected by evictions, so the ones in with the orange dots here on the right-hand side, also have a high risk of infection, which increases with the uh, eviction rate. However, we see again that the impact on COVID cases is also experienced in general by the population as a whole. So as eviction rates increase, even households in this higher socioeconomic neighborhood who aren't directly affected had increased infection rates. So we decided uh, to use the ideas that I've discussed so far to build a very data-driven model of the city of Philadelphia. And we chose this as our case study because the eviction crisis is particularly bad there and the policies are quite contentious. In fact, in, the, in July of 2020, the city council passed an Emergency Housing Protection Act, 
in an effort to prevent uh, evictions during the pandemic, but they were immediately sued by an association of residential investment and rental property owners, where one of the claims was whether this, society, uh, this legislation was of a broad societal interest rather than just protecting a narrow class of renters. And so one of the early motivations of this work was to assess this claim. So Philadelphia, like all major US cities, has significant heterogeneity in housing stability and other socioeconomic factors, which are very relevant to both the risk of eviction as well as COVID-19 infection. So to include these important disparities in our model, we first use principal component analysis on the suite of socioeconomic indicators, which is available from the census, and use this to classify zip codes in the city. Via this analysis, we found that the city could be clustered into three major groups corresponding to a high, moderate, and low income. Where it turns out that the low income cluster has both high eviction rates and higher rates of service industry employment, so essential workers, as you might have expected. So this allowed us to create a hierarchical network model for Philly, where the population was divided into three groups. The size of each group was obtained from data and each group had were given their corresponding eviction rates. Then for, to parameterize the rest of the model, we used mobility data. So we used co-location events measured by anonymous mobile phone data to determine the extent of interaction within and between these different groups. So in other words, we use this data to determine how external connections of individuals are distributed throughout the city. And overall, we found that individuals preferentially mix with others in their own group with some intercluster contacts. Early on in the pandemic, it had become apparent that differences in adoption of social distancing measures was related to disparities in income. And so by using reduction in mobility to be proportional to the degree of adoption of social distancing measures, we were able to capture these differences for each of the subpopulation as well as type of contact. And lastly, this mobility data was also used to justify our assumption that evicted households tended to double up with other households in their same subpopulation. There are sadly no data sets available which track the geographic origin and destination of individuals who experience evictions but we could observe general housing relocations using the mobility data and found that they predominantly occurred within the same cluster. Um, so it turned out that we only had to tune infection prevalence at the time that uh, strong social distancing policies were implemented in March, this is the first vertical line, to find that our model did match best available information on the epidemic trajectory in Philly, which is this blue curve here. Furthermore, seroprevalence over time predicted by our model, so which is this gray line here, as well as the shaded area, was in general agreement with results from large serological surveys that were conducted in different populations in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania as a whole. And these are given by these scattered points here. Our model also predicts large disparities in seroprevalence between the different groups. And this approach therefore allowed us to make more tailored predictions about the impact of evictions in Philly. The pre-pandemic levels of eviction um, would have led to about 5,000 excess cases by December of 2020. However, many analyses suggested that these rates could actually be much higher, even five times as much due to the economic crisis and could have led to up to 50,000 excess cases. The relative risk of infection is higher for households that were directly affected by evictions given here on this plot on the left hand side. But the effects of evictions were again also just felt across the city as a risk of infection increased for other households in the population, which is given here uh, in the plot on the right. So overall, our results suggest that the eviction moratoria in Philadelphia have had a substantial impact on COVID-19 cases throughout the city from September to December of 2020. So to conclude this bit of the talk, our analysis demonstrates that evictions can lead to a significant increase in the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in cities, as well as to reduce the effectiveness of social distancing measures. In fact, this will hold for any similar infectious disease where household transmission plays an important role. 
We found that this effect is also more pronounced in cities where the pandemic was growing at the time evictions took place and also in cities with high segregation. However, it's very important to note that the effect is not just limited to those who were evicted and those whose households those families moved into. Other households in the city also experienced an increased risk of infection due to spillover uh, process from the spillover of this transmission process. And so overall, the main immediate implication of our finding is that the CDC mandated national order to prohibit evictions likely prevented thousands of excess infections for every million metropolitan residents between uh, September and December of 2020. So this modeling study, like any other, has a number of different caveats. The fates of individuals that experience evictions is difficult to track and more studies are needed to uh, precisely characterize this. Whatever existing data we could find, which is uh, mainly the fragile family study, suggested that historically doubling up was the most predominant outcome. And so we decided to focus on that. Secondly, there are still a um, significant number of unknowns about the role of household spread. So in our model, we simplified this by not considering the effects of say household crowding or the age structure, which might uh, influence the results. And finally, the focus should be on the qualitative nature of the results and not the precise numerical estimates from our model as they're subject to uncertainties, even though we did try to use the best available estimates for all the different parameters. So for the last part, I'm just going to focus on another effect of the population structure, which, has, which doesn't really have to do with household transmission, which I've been focusing on so far. So generally, there are just many other complex ways in which the structure of human contact networks can impact the patterns of disease spread. Um, and so just for the last few minutes, I'm going to quickly describe one such effect, which was observed for COVID-19 very early on in the pandemic. Our collaborators in Northeastern and Oxford universities looked in detail at the entire shape of epidemic curves all across Chinese cities during the very early stages of the epidemic in 2020. And they looked at many determinants of these different trajectories. And they found that the degree of crowding, so here crowding uh, takes into account both the population density as well as the distribution in the region. And they saw that it was strongly associated with the epidemic path. And here the epidemic path was measured by how intense an epidemic was, so how peaked in time it was. So you can see these two example uh, epidemic paths on here on the far left where there's a low intensity curve and a high intensity curve. So the low intensity is basically more spread out over time and you see a little peak here in the high intensity curve. And you can sort of um, measure this using the Shannon entropy of the time series. And in this middle figure here, you can see that this, if you plot this epidemic intensity as a function of this crowding, that they're, they're inversely related. Uh, so this is an interesting observation that the epidemics in sparser cities were more intense, that is clustered in time, than in crowded cities, which saw more uh, spread out outbreaks. And it turned out to be independent of the total size or population of the region. And these results are quite surprising and opposite to what a simple, well-mixed model of disease spread might suggest. So you might think that in a more crowded city, because are not as higher as there's just a lot more people around or there are a lot more people interacting with each other, this would lead to a sharper curve where you would just see a very sharp increase uh, in infections. And whereas in a more sparser city, you might expect that this curve might be flatter. But however, we showed that this can be, this counterintuitive result can be explained if you model contacts within cities as far as the following hierarchical or nested structure, where people have the most contacts with others in their households, so these are these immediate contacts, less but still a substantial probability of contacting others within some neighborhood around them. So these are these contacts between different smaller circles, and then weaker connections with people in different neighborhoods of the city. And so in this sort of model, you can counterintuitively, 
counterintuitively get more dispersed epidemics uh, when there's more connectivity between these neighborhoods. So these two networks here show you example realization of these simulations. So in the sparse network, you see that uh, if the infection arises in the neighborhood, it tends to generally stick around there. And so which leads to an epidemic that's concentrated in one area. Whereas in this other figure here, this is more of a crowded neighborhood. So there's a lot more interaction between people from different neighborhoods. And so the epidemic starts in one, but it does spread to others. And it sort of leads to this a more longer dispersed curve, as you can see here on the bottom right plot. Um, so yeah, so I think this brings us to the end of my talk. I'd like to thank my advisor, Alison Hill, as well as all of our collaborators. Uh, this is work was an, definitely a huge group effort with each project involving a subset of this wonderful team. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Angelica, that was a great talk. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. I have some questions that I'll, I'll just wait to see if somebody wants to jump in or if not, I can, I can start off. Start off. Um, so I have two questions. The first mm -hmm. is in the epidemiological model where you have I1, I2, I3, um, mm -hmm. which distinguishes the severity. Do you consider that each of those classes are infectious for the whole period? Because I would assume, for example, that critical individuals are no longer infectious by the time they've reached the ICU. So how do you mm -hmm. account for that? In, in the yeah, no, that's a very good question. Actually, we only allowed I1 to be infectious. And so, cause there was a lot of data at the time suggesting that maybe people who were hospitalized by that point or especially the ones in critical care weren't really spreading infection. Mm -hmm. uh, so to just make it simpler, we just let people who were in this mild class of infection be the ones who were spreading. Okay, interesting. And, and did you look at how sensitive your predictions are to how long you're in that class? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did do a lot of sensitivity analysis to make sure uh, that the the qualitative nature of the results is pretty robust. Right, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the second question I had was about the second part of the talk where in the simpler model before you got to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. we have higher socioeconomic status. Uh, you assumed no evictions um, in that class, uh, mm -hmm. but in the Philadelphia data, there was about 1% evictions in the higher yeah. mm -hmm. one. And so I guess, the only effect would probably be to worsen, I guess, the trends that you see, or do you think that that would have another um, effect if you now allowed also uh, some lower effect or a lower percentage of evictions in the, in the higher yeah. economic class? I think overall, it would definitely just lead to worsening everything, but maybe the sort of relative risk per neighborhood that would reduce because now even in this higher socioeconomic neighbor you have overall more infection prevalent right okay yeah that makes sense yeah but that um, was just like supposed to be a sort of a toy model <laughs> to oh no see. of course no no no. I'm sorry i was it's not a criticism i was actually yeah no no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay veronica has a question and she says great work and presentation um how does the risk of infection in the model uh depend on the number of people in the house and have you tried to implement different assumptions to model secondary attack rates yes so so I'm guessing this is for the first part of the talk. Is that, I, I guess it, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I think we did do sensitivity analysis that looked at different secondary attack rates uh, to see how that would affect the results. And generally, as I guess, as what you might expect, if there isn't that much within household transmission occurring, then a lot of these effects are reduced. But if the within household transmission is higher, then they increase. Um, and so definitely just depends on the details of household transmission. And so we are trying to get people to do experiments or just get better data on household transmission because there isn't really that much. Right, yeah, makes sense. Um, especially with changing variants, I assume, obviously. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Changing variants and like once, because age structure is also a very important thing which we've ignored. Um, right, right, yeah. And so, yeah, that could also change things and now also with vaccination and everything. So I think it's just, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, does any, are there any other questions? I'll just note that in in Canada, we did have a second lockdown in, in the winter. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> you can look at you know our our areas to see if your model um, predicts what happens here. I guess I just don't know if eviction is that that much of a problem in Canada, are they? Um, I think it's yeah. I think there's still an issue. Um, someone will correct me. I'm not sure if we had more. I think we did actually have more torrents, yeah, in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, there okay. definitely were in BC as well too. So I'm not really sure what the status of those are, but uh, it might be an interesting case study because you do have different lockdown. Yeah, measures. no, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a mm -hmm. curfew in Quebec, for example. So. Oh wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah um okay well if there are no other questions i just want to say thank you again i think these are really important questions that you know we look at maybe less in terms of heterogeneity especially looking at um different context structures so i know that this is something that lots of people look at but i think overall in general it's a really important question so thanks for sharing your your results with us and uh um, i look forward to our next talk which is uh in April and will be a bit more biologically focused. Um, it will be given by an immunologist and I think we might look a bit more um, on the cancer side. So looking forward to seeing you all then. And thanks again, Angelica, for your great Cool. Time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Great, have a good day. See everyone soon. Bye.